So that weekend kind of sucked. Um, not only did Notre Dame lose their top target left on the board in five-star defensive tackle Justin Scott, they also lost a commitment from four-star wide receiver Isaiah Canyon as he flipped his pledge from the Irish to Georgia Tech. Where do the Irish go from here? That's next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into Locked On Irish and happy 4th of July, everyone. And thank you for making this your first listen of the day right before you get your celebration going. As always, you can find the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, I really appreciate you joining me here today on a holiday. But if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, this is your reminder to do so now. I'm Tyler Wojak and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018 and have been podcasting about the football team since 2020. I've also been covering college football as a producer for the two major sports networks since I graduated, first for ESPN and the Fox Sports headquarters since the fall of 2021. Today on the show, we're going to talk about Notre Dame's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad recruiting weekend. The big headline, obviously, is that Notre Dame's can't-miss prospect, five-star defensive tackle Justin Scott, who is from nearby Chicago, Illinois, announced his commitment to the Ohio State Buckeyes on Sunday night. And to add insult to injury, four-star wide receiver Isaiah Canyon flipped his commitment from Notre Dame to Georgia Tech all in the span of one weekend. So I'll talk about Canyon in segment three, but let's start with the Scott news because I've seen a lot. And I mean, a lot of really strong reactions from Notre Dame fans online since he made his announcement. And look, there's no sugarcoating it. Scott's decision is an absolutely brutal blow to Notre Dame's 2024 recruiting class. But some of the reaction I've seen is a little over the top. So I'm going to spend these next two segments breaking down what's real and what's not as it pertains to Scott and Notre Dame recruiting as a whole. First off, the outcome, it really wasn't surprising to me at all. The timing is because I expected this recruitment to drag all the way down to the wire, and maybe it will, but right now, Justin Scott is going to Ohio State. So let's figure out what happened first. But before we get into the why and why it, what it means for Notre Dame, I think Scott's timeline is very telling uh, as a means of for us understanding what really happened here. So let's go back to December of 2022. Notre Dame was the clear leader for Justin Scott. He had already done a couple unofficial visits to Notre Dame and allegedly gave the Notre Dame coaching staff a silent commitment and announced a date to make his commitment public on January 31st, which is his birthday. Then Georgia came in with a scholarship offer pretty late for a player of his caliber, I might add. I always thought that was kind of weird how late they entered into that recruitment, but as soon as they offered him a scholarship, everything really changed with his recruitment. He decided to cancel his announcement and effectively reopened his recruitment in that moment. It's important to bring up Marcus Freeman's policy with commits to Notre Dame uh, because I think that ha that played a big part in why Scott decided not to make his commitment public because I think he wanted to consider George as an option. And I understand why, man. They're the best football program in the entire country now and really have been for the past two seasons. So if he were to commit to Notre Dame publicly, then he would not be able to really entertain Georgia as a recruit. So he decides to hold off on that announcement. And look, we can argue whether or not Freeman's policy about recruits, whether that's a good idea or not. We can do that another time. But in this case, I think it hurt Notre Dame. So Scott obviously was interested in what Georgia had to offer. And so he decides to back off from announcing his commitment. And ever since then, Notre Dame drifted further and further away in their recruitment. So that was sort of a red flag at the time. But the really bigger red flag to me was around the blue and gold game when it sounded like Justin Scott was going to make the trip, watch the Notre Dame spring game, and then he couldn't because he allegedly couldn't get off his job or couldn't get off work at his job at Starbucks. Like, come on, dude, is that one shift at Starbucks going to really matter compared to where you're ultimately going to make your college decision and hopefully for your future make millions of dollars as an NFL draft pick? That seems way more important than that one shift as a barista at Starbucks, although shout out to all the baristas out there. I know they've got a difficult job. So pretty much from that moment on, it seemed like Georgia might have been the leader considering what happened as soon as they sent in that offer. But then Miami looked like they were going to land him in the spring. Scott took a couple unofficial visits to Miami's campus. Uh, he was there for a spring break. He was there for multiple days. And on April 27th, Steve, Steve Wiltfong, the director of recruiting at 24-7 Sports, I think he's one of the most locked in recruiting analysts in at any outlet uh, across all of the college football networks out there. He put in a crystal ball prediction that Scott would end up committing to the Hurricanes. And Scott himself said that Miami was the leader on multiple occasions. Then we get to June. 
Scott announces his official visit schedule. First, he's going to go to Georgia, then Michigan, then Miami, and then Ohio State. You'll notice that Notre Dame didn't make the cut, and as we've gone over on this podcast many times, a recruit's actions are way more telling than his words, and even though he claimed he was still interested in Notre Dame, the fact that they were not one of his official visits said a lot. I know that there was reports out there that he was going to go to Notre Dame and do his official visit during the fall for the Notre Dame-Ohio State game in South Bend, but that did not line up with what he was saying about when he wanted to make his commitment. He said multiple times he wanted to make his commitment before the start of his senior season, so it really didn't make sense that he was going to do his official visit at Notre Dame during the middle of his season. So that was another really big red flag. And I I was sort of like, look, I don't really think Notre Dame has a shot right now, especially when all that Miami stuff was going on. I just didn't really see it happening, especially with the official visit schedule. But still, I was kind of holding out hope because coming out of the official visits, the reports coming out of Miami weren't that great. The proximity to home was a real factor. That was a big reason why Notre Dame thought they had such a good, uh, they were in such good, good position to land him because the, I mean, Notre Dame's only two hours away from Chicago. So uh, Justin Scott's really close with his mom. His mom was all on board, obviously, with him coming to Notre Dame, not only because of the proximity to to home, but the academics and all that stuff that, of course, is going to play well with the recruits' parents. And after Miami seemed to be sort of drifting further and further away, recruiting insider Brian Smith came on this podcast just last week, and he said basically that Scott's mom did not want him to go to Miami because it was so far away. Scott's official visit to Miami effectively crossed them off the list, which is not something you hear that often. Uh, It did happen with Notre Dame this cycle, though, with Elijah Rushing, because once he visited Notre Dame, they were pretty much off the list. But anyway, let's get back to Justin Scott. It looked like it was down to Michigan, Ohio State, and Notre Dame now that Miami was sort of out of it. Now, there's a little bit of momentum for Notre Dame. It was still sort of odd that they weren't the official visit, but you're thinking, okay, If he really wants to stay in the Midwest, maybe Notre Dame has a shot here. And then you started to hear some reports out there that Michigan had actually gained a ton of traction following his official visit there in June. And as Chad Simmons from On3 reported, Scott was actually very close to giving Jim Harbaugh a silent commitment when he was in Ann Arbor. But Ohio State had the last visit, and that ended up being the difference. Coming out of that, Scott told the Ohio State staff that that was where he was going to go. And on Sunday night... Scott made that commitment public. He was going to go to the Ohio State Buckeyes. So that is what we know for sure. Everything I just mentioned is public information, and most of it has been backed up by Scott publicly, or it's been reported by credible reporters out there. So now let's get into the why. Why did Justin Scott pick Ohio State? Before we get into all the speculation, let's look at what Justin Scott had to say about his reasoning for picking Ohio State, because I personally feel like he's a pretty good source on this topic. Sure, I know some fans out there might disagree, but let's see what Scott had to say. He said to Chad Simmons, quote, I was ready to commit to Michigan, and then we visited Ohio State, and the one thing that pushed them over the top was getting coached by Larry Johnson, end quote. Now, look, I know there's going to be a lot of fans out there that are going to dismiss this and blame NIL as the reason that Scott picked Ohio State. That's that's what happens now in the NIL era. Fans from every school, not just Notre Dame, use NIL as a cop-out for whenever a prospect doesn't commit to their school because... For whatever reason, blaming money is a lot easier to accept than admitting another school might just be a better option for a player than the one they're a fan of. This is not exclusively a Notre Dame problem. Like I said, this happens with every school and every fan base. So I reached out to a couple people in the know to get a better sense of Scott's decision, and basically they backed up what Scott's comments, uh, what, what Scott said publicly. Larry Johnson just flat out won this one, and honestly, I believe it. Larry Johnson is arguably the best defensive line coach in the entire country. If you don't know who he is or don't understand how impressive his resume is, let's go through it. Since Johnson joined the Ohio State staff in 2014, they have had 15 defensive linemen drafted into the NFL. 15. That's tied for the most with Alabama and three more than the next team, which is Clemson with 12. Three of those 15 went in the first round. The only teams who have had more first-round draft picks on the defensive line are Clemson with six and Georgia and Michigan. They're tied with four. Eight. Ohio State defensive linemen have earned first-team All-American honors under Johnson, and he has coached a total of 14 first-team All-Americans at Ohio State and Penn State. Trey Scott, the defensive line coach at Georgia, certainly has an argument to be the best defensive line coach in college football for what he has done since he took over that role in Athens in 2017. And even if you hate the fact that Mike Elson left Notre Dame to take the job at Michigan, we all know how good he is at developing talent on the defensive line. He did a fantastic job 
during his decade plus tenure as a defensive line coach for Notre Dame, and losing him was a major blow. So when Scott tells Hayes Fawcett that he picked Ohio State over Michigan and Georgia, three schools with the best defensive line coaches in the entire country, who are also very competitive and were all three in the college football playoff last season, should we be surprised? This isn't even knocking Al Washington, who I'll talk more about in segment two. This is just a fact. Compared to those other coaches, he just doesn't compare right now. So, Scott said he wants to go to Ohio State because that's where he has the best chance to develop as a football player, and I believe him. The proof is already there that Johnson can do exactly that and better than practically everyone else in the entire entire country. And not only that, Johnson has proven to be an exceptional recruiter. Look at Ohio State's starting defensive line this upcoming season. JT Tuomolau, he was the number two overall recruit in the country in the class of 2019 and the number one defensive lineman. Jack Sawyer, the other starting defensive end, he was the sixth-ranked prospect in the country. Michael Hall Jr., the starting defensive tackle, was the 37th-ranked player in his class in 2021. So when we look at this all again, should we really be surprised that Larry Johnson won out in this recruitment? I don't think so. Justin Scott is an excellent football player. He wanted to go to a school that was in the Midwest and gave him a great chance to develop into a future NFL draft pick. So he chose to go to the program that's been the best program in the Midwest for over two decades and to play for an assistant coach who has produced more NFL draft picks at his position than any coach in the country during the past 10 years and will likely be around for the duration of Scott's career because Johnson up to this point has shown no desire to leave for another job or leave for a defensive coordinator position. He is very happy with being the associate head coach and the defensive line coach at Ohio State. So maybe the only surprising thing about this is that we didn't see it coming sooner. That being said, I'm not ruling out the fact that NIL didn't play a part in this decision. I'm actually pretty positive that it did, and I'll explain more about what I mean right after this. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you could spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. All on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So, sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. So now that I've gone over the main reason why I think Justin Scott picked Ohio State, let's talk about the NIL piece of it because I don't want to sound naive and pretend that it wasn't a factor because I think it is. It's just not as much as some fans are making it out to be. I've said on this podcast a few times now that outside of like a very select few schools like Texas A&M, Oregon, and Miami, pretty much every single fan base is currently mad or has been mad about their school's approach to NIL at some point or another. Literally everyone. Just think about this time last year. Ohio State fans were up in arms. They were mad that they weren't get, giving out enough money. Nick Saban, Nick Saban was telling Alabama boosters that they weren't ponying up enough money, and that's why they were losing out on, uh, on recruits to schools like Tex A&M. I even hear it from USC fans out here that they are getting outbid. Think about that. USC getting outbid in NIL. So trust me, pretty much everyone has been pissed about their school's approach to NIL. But but now that we're a year away from that, you'll notice that a lot of the best schools, you don't hear complaints about Alabama and NIL or Ohio State for that matter. That's because the best schools, the best programs have figured it out. And Ohio State is now one of them. JBook37 is a po- prominent contributor to Ohio State's 24-7 outlet. Uh, he was pretty forthcoming on Twitter about this as well. Quote, People saying Ohio State's NIL playing a major role with these top recruits. I'm looking at them like, is that supposed to be an insult? I'm happy as hell Ohio State has two NIL entities crushing it right now. This time last year, the Buckeyes got their ass handed to them because of NIL. End quote. And he's right. There was even a point this past offseason where I heard from a very credible source that USC was close to getting Marvin Harrison Jr. in the transfer portal to join the Trojans in 2023. Then about a month later, it really picked up some steam in the rumor mill, and you had people like Andy Staples mentioning it publicly that that was a real thing that might happen. Obviously, it didn't end up happening, but I think that was a wake-up call because Ohio State, you don't really hear about them now with NIL and and them not being able to pony up to recruits. And the reason why you don't hear about Ohio State in the same vein as like Texas A&M and Oregon is because they've been patient. They're working smarter than other schools, and they're reserving their money for the very top recruits and also maintaining the best players on their current roster. And clearly, the fact that my, uh, the fact that Justin Scott was favoring Miami at one point shows that NIL was a factor because Miami has done nothing on the field to warrant that type of attention from a player of his caliber. But... Scott also said that he was ready to commit to Michigan at one point, and that point was fairly recently. 
And you know who is very averse to NIL, especially with recruits? Jim Harbaugh. Just look at the Michigan message boards and see how pissed their fans get about his reluctance to get his hands dirty in the NIL game. Look at them recently. Why do you think Michigan fans think that he's not coming to, to Michigan? It's NIL. That didn't prevent them from being a major player in this recruitment. So clearly, it was a factor. And if I had to guess which school out of Ohio State, Michigan, and Notre Dame offered Justin Scott the most money, I would guess Ohio State. But to say that's the only reason why he would go there is ignorant and off base. Frankly, it is just another thing that Ohio State is going for them among a long list of things that they've had going for them well before NIL was the thing. So that brings us to Notre Dame and Marcus Freeman. The selling point for Marcus Freeman was that he was going to continue to build off the success from the Brian, Brian Kelly era. And for all the Brian Kelly haters out there who are going to say that Kelly wasn't that great of a coach and that he was holding Notre Dame back, he went 54-10 and 10 over his last five years. That was not by accident. It's because he's a damn good coach, and he had things rolling at Notre Dame. And then the idea was that Freeman was going to take that success and elevate the program to even greater heights by recruiting harder than Kelly ever did. In the year and a half since Marcus Freeman was fired, he has not done either of those things. He just hasn't. He went 8-4 and four in his first regular season. He signed the 12th ranked recruiting class in 2023, his first full recruiting class as a head coach, and he will likely sign another class outside of the top 10 in 2024. And before you scream at me and you start calling me a Freeman hater or act like I'm writing him off, relax, all right? Put, put the pitchforks down because I'm still a believer in Marcus Freeman. I'm just pointing out that the things that we were hoping for and anticipated, it just has not happened like we had hoped. And look, there's plenty of excuses why Marcus Freeman has not excelled as the head coach so far. Drew Pine, for example, certainly impacted the results in the field last season, especially against Stanford, but he didn't start against Marshall. And on the recruiting end, obviously Notre Dame's stance on NAL is a hindrance to what Marcus Freeman is able to do as a recruiter. I'm not denying that at all. And I have no doubt that if Notre Dame was operating on a completely even playing field, as everyone else when it came to NIL, Notre Dame would be able to sign more top recruits. I'm with you guys, okay? The administration and the university as a whole really needs to figure out how they can have a better handle on, on NIL when it comes to recruits because I actually think they're starting to figure out a little bit more when it comes to players who are actually in college because I'm not going to really break any news on this podcast that Sam Hartman got quite a bit of NIL money to come to Notre Dame, and they were willing to pay him money even though that he had frankly not deserved it, or excuse me, he had frankly not done anything at Notre Dame to earn that type of money. They were paying him off of what he did at other school or at a different school. So why would Notre Dame be willing to do it with the top, you know, five-star prospects in the class? I'm not saying every single recruit, and they're never going to be in the same boat as like Miami or Oregon, and they're paying these massive acquisition fees like some of these other schools out there. I don't think Notre Dame is ever going to be able to do that. But in instances like one with Justin Scott or like Elijah Rushing or like a Keon Keeley, maybe they should be a little bit more open to paying NIL monies. That is not Marcus Freeman's fault, okay? But considering the times we're in, Marcus Freeman and everyone else involved in the program, they're just going to have to adjust with the current circumstances, okay? I have no doubt that Freeman works his ass off to build relationships and do everything he can to get recruits to come to Notre Dame. But the results are the results. He swung and missed on Keon Keeley, Peyton Bowen, Dante Moore, and now Justin Scott. And you can make the excuses all you want, but it's like if I studied really hard for a test and then got a D, like I can tell the professor how hard I studied and how much time and effort I put into the exam, but if I got a D, do you think that professor gives a shit? No, and why should they? Because it, the results are what they are, and I could make a million excuses. I could say that I was sleep deprived, I've got all these things going on, but the results are what they are. And so far, in the Marcus Freeman era, Notre Dame has not recruited to the level that we were all hoping for when he was hired, okay? So... Where does Notre Dame go from here? I think it starts in the field. Marcus Freeman has got to get this team in 2023 in position to beat some of the best teams on the schedule. Fortunately for Freeman, he's got three great opportunities to do it against Ohio State, Clemson, and USC. You want to get the attention of these top recruits? Beat two of those teams, especially Ohio State. You beat Ohio State this season, all of a sudden these top recruits who frankly have not they might have considered Notre Dame, but in the end, they did not pick Notre Dame. You, that would get their attention real quick, okay? So he has to win at least one of those games, hopefully two. There's a lot of talent on this roster, and if things go right, they have a chance to make the college football playoff this season. That was something that Brian Kelly did, but Kelly didn't capitalize on that as well on the recruiting trail as he should have. That is something that Marcus Freeman can do, and he has a lot more control of that than he does with the NIL situation. So... Obviously, Notre Dame needs to be more proactive 
with their approach to NIL, and they need to figure it out fast. I think they've progressed a lot over the last year. I mentioned the Marcus, or I mentioned the Sam Hartman thing. He got a bag. Now they need to start investing more in recruits. And I know Marcus Freeman has some concerns about how that will affect the locker room. And you know what? Sometimes he's going to get burned. Sometimes they're going to pay the wrong recruits who don't amount to as much in college, or they might end up leaving in the transfer portal or something like that. But you have got to keep up with the arms race in college football. They're playing from behind to begin with because of all the things that have existed for decades, really. The fact that Notre Dame is located in northern Indiana, the lack of a social life in South Bend, the academic standards, all of it. Now, NIL is getting in the way. So when you haven't proven it on the field with the current coaching staff, as is the case with Notre Dame right now, and you aren't able to compete with some of the other top programs financially, you end up where we are today with Justin Scott. So it's not all Marcus Freeman's fault, but it's also not entirely the administration's fault either. It's on both. Marcus Freeman needs to prove it on the field as far that he can coach and develop with the very best of them, get this team to the playoffs, show that Notre Dame can be an elite team under your watch, and provide these recruits proof of concept. For the administration, support your coach who loves the university so much and works so hard to have success at your school despite all of the restrictions you put on him. Work with fun. Make that public. Make sure that every single big-time donor with an affiliation to Notre Dame knows where they can put their money towards to help the football program, okay? And everyone can win here. Everyone just has to work together, and we will see if this decision, amongst many other things that have happened to Notre Dame over the past year and a half, will be the wake-up call that the school needs to figure it out. I'll leave you with this, though, on Justin Scott. We're still five months away from the early signing period, and Scott has said publicly that five separate teams have led in his recruitment over the past six months. Are we certain that his recruitment won't have more swings in one direction over the next five months? I'm not so sure. All right, coming up in segment three, I'll explain why Isaiah Canyon's decommitment might have bigger implications than you might expect. Okay, so it's somewhat lost in the whole Justin Scott saga, but Notre Dame lost one of their top prospects in the class of 2024 over the weekend. Four-star receiver Isaiah Canyon decommitted from Notre Dame and then a couple days later announced his commitment to Georgia Tech. Right off the bat, I just want to say this is a tough blow for the Notre Dame class because even though they have two other really talented wide receivers in this class, I really liked what Canyon offered. He's six foot three, he's at 190 pounds, and I think that we were just starting to see what he could be as a wide receiver because at his high school team uh, at Warner Robins, Georgia, which is also the same high school that Chancey Stuckey, Notre Dame's wide receiver coach, went to. Uh, he played a bunch of positions at his high school. He played quarterback. He played wide receiver. So we didn't really get to see like a full season of what he's like at wide receiver. And he was extremely talented at every position he played because he's such a freak athlete. But I think that he had a really high ceiling at Notre Dame. So this is definitely a tough blow. Now, the thing is, I don't really know what Notre Dame could have done differently in this recruitment because they, I mean, Canyon was not committed that long. He committed to Notre Dame on April 27th and then decommitted July 1st. And really, not long after he committed to Notre Dame, there were start, sort of some rumblings that he might be decommitting and that there were other top programs in the in the South going after him. Again, it's tough for Notre Dame to get players out of Georgia, especially if a school like Georgia wants them. I don't know how interested Georgia was in Isaiah Canyon, but he clearly wanted to stay home. That's the reason why he went to Georgia Tech. There have been some reports out there that there's some people in his family who couldn't travel to South Bend to see him play, and ultimately that was a major factor in his decision. I'm sure that the Notre Dame coaching staff would have liked more time to be able to talk to Isaiah and sort of, you know, explain why he would be such a good fit in this class and try to figure out a way to work around the family dynamic. But the thing is, like, if your home base isn't supporting your decision to go to school, it's going to be really hard for Notre Dame to make a move on him. So Canyon decided to decommit, and I, I fully expect that the Notre Dame uh, coaching staff is just going to move on from him. I don't think that there's any chance that Isaiah Canyon could ultimately flip back to Notre Dame at any point in the future. But this is a tough blow, and uh, I think Notre Dame definitely needs to add at least one more wide receiver in this class. Uh, once they had those three, once they had Cam Williams, uh, Isaiah Canyon, and Micah Gilbert all committed, I think they were pretty much set in the class of 2024. Now, obviously, with Canyon out the door, it opens up the chance for Notre Dame to go after another receiver. So I know that some people were like, all right, Notre Dame needs to go after the five-star Ryan Wingo, who was a recruit that they uh, – we're definitely in the mix for early on in his recruitment. That is certainly not the case now. I actually just saw a crystal ball for Ryan Wingo to pick Texas. Um, so Notre Dame seems to be out on him, and that's fine. I think if they try to go in for some last-ditch effort now on a player of his caliber, it just wouldn't make sense. It would probably end up being a waste of time because, frankly, he's just not considering Notre Dame at this point. The good thing for Notre Dame is that they have five months before early signing day, so they have time to get out there, evaluate. And they also have an entire 
season of high school football left to sort of maybe find a diamond in the rough out there. They still have Cam Williams. That's the most important prospect in the entire class outside of C.J. Carr, the quarterback. But Cam Williams is rated a little bit higher. He's like a very high four-star, not not a five-star anymore because he dipped a little bit in some recruiting rankings. But don't get it twisted. He's an extremely talented player and one of the best receiver prospects to come through Notre Dame in a very long time. On the current roster, um, I feel like they're pretty good Depth-wise, it could always be better, though, and you got to think, like, there's still some question marks at the position. Guys like Deion Colsey, who have another year of eligibility left after this season, what's going to happen with him? How are these young guys going to pan out? What's going to happen with Chancey Suckey? There's definitely some questions about the position, but still, overall, I think the receiver room is in good shape, and they've got plenty of time to add that third receiver in this class. I would hope that Notre Dame takes their time with this one, find out, you know, who out there it would actually consider going to Notre Dame, which players of high caliber could come in and make a difference because I don't think Notre Dame should just take receiver for the hell of it. They don't really need to do that. Um, I think they have time to evaluate and get a player who's actually pretty good, who maybe someone who they didn't get uh, or they weren't looking at that hard early on who could end up being a really good player. Let's look back a few years at when Notre Dame really went all in on Will Shipley at running back. They were That was really the only back they were looking at at the time. That was actually part of the recruitment to Shipley was that, hey, We want you. We're not looking at anyone else. And then Shipley said, that's great. Don't care. Going to Clemson. What did Notre Dame do after that? They bounced back and got commitments from Audric Esme and Logan Diggs. Even though Logan Diggs ended up transferring, both players were hits at Notre Dame. And you look ahead to this season, Audric Esme is one of the best players on the entire team. So the coaching staff has time to sort of bounce back from this, and they can still get a player of really like a, of really good caliber. But the problem is they're probably not going to be rated super high because we're, we're so late in the recruiting process. The timing is tough because it's coming after June, the official visit month. Uh, it obviously would have been great if Notre Dame knew that Isaiah Canyon wasn't going to be around and they could get some wide receivers on campus but I don't think it's the end of the world they still got plenty of time to figure this out the 2024 class on offense is still looking really really promising and I have full faith that Chancey Stuckey even with the limited amount of time is going to be able to go out there find a really talented wide receiver prospect and get him to commit to Notre Dame so that Notre Dame has three commits they have the numbers they need in this class and then you pair these three whoever that third ends up being with the freshman class that's currently on campus for Notre Dame Guys like Jaden Greathouse, Braylon James, Rico Flores, and even K.K. Smith, those guys could be end up being really, really good. So getting more guys in this class that are just as good, if not better, is really just like it's a plus. It's a surplus, which is not something that Notre Dame has had at the wide receiver position in a long time. So definitely a blow, definitely unfortunate for the class, but I have faith that Chancey Saki, Jared Parker, and Marcus Freeman are going to be able to figure this one out. All right. That's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Quick programming note, there will be no show on Wednesday, July 5th, but I will be back again with a new episode on Thursday and Friday of this week, so be on the lookout for that. Before you go, remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Enjoy the holiday, everybody. Do not let Notre Dame recruiting get you down. Go out there, enjoy the nice weather, drink some Miller Lights, and I will talk to you again on Thursday.